I, I was eight years in the Air Force active duty and I had uh, two deployments to Iraq. Right. Um, I never I never did Afghanistan. Um, I'm also a military spouse and my husband did Afghanistan a number of times. He was part of the invading force. Um, so it's all very near and dear to our hearts what's going mm -hmm. on and what happened and and Garrett, I went to Kosovo for nine months, sniper school, and then Iraq for a year. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Richard. Richard is our was a former president, is now our vice president, and his son uh, was in Iraq. Um, yes. Yeah, it was a pretty bad time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to give some some background to Ann, um, so she knows that you know who we you know who we are to some extent. Yeah. And uh, Ann Jones, meet everybody, Richard and Flora and Martha. Hello. There are- uh, Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Very nice to be with this group. There are uh, 20 people signed up for, the, for this session. So I want to give them a little bit of time to, to show up. I'm Kimball. Is this the way you've been holding your meetings? Yeah, for the last year and a half, uh, pretty oh, much. Uh, we usually, hey Don. Um, hey Don. Yeah, we usually meet. Uh, we meet in uh, in Portland uh, in Brunswick, uh, and then Augusta. We meet the last Thursday of every month, and we just rotate um, different different places, different venues. But for the last year and a half, it's been Zoom, uh, pretty much. Uh, and how many? Oh so, yeah, a whole bunch of people joining us. Good, cool. Pardon? How many people are in in your crowd? In our, in our chapter, there's about I think there are about seventy. Um, we have, and we cover the whole state. It's a huge state, right? And we used to have a chapter in Bangor, but uh, it sort of you know, uh, died off. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, to represent the entire state is you know it's pretty hard to do, to tell you the truth. So. Other people joining us. Oh my goodness, here they come. <clears throat> I was trying to introduce everybody to Ann so she knows who she's talking about. Don Kimball does this radio, amazing radio program down in, uh, in, in Portland. Uh, Dan Ellis is our treasurer and our computer dude. University John of Southern Morris. Maine. <laughs> John Morris is our secretary. Peggy Akers is our uh, former president of our chapter. And uh, uh, she was a nurse in Vietnam uh, and is still a very active nurse right now. Um, let's see, Peter Morgan, it's Peter down on the, on the coast there as well. He's the guy, he's our major connection to Moms Demand Action. Um, he'll be talking about that tonight a little bit, I hope. Uh, keeps us involved with, with that. Yeah, but enough, Peter, enough. enough. Um, yeah, let's give it a couple more minutes, folks. Yikes. Yikes, yikes. Hi, Dad. Doug Hendrick is a, uh, a Vietnam veteran as well, and he's done all this amazing work. And we have the senior uh, um, uh, uh, seniors group at our, our Farmington, and uh, he's going to be showing his film, this amazing film that he was involved in that included uh, NVA troops as well as American troops who were seriously wounded during the war and a, a bike trip they took from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City. Um, this film is about that, and Dud was an integral part of that, so he's going to be showing that. Uh, and he was recently on Don on, on Don Kimball's radio show as well. So, Dave Larson, good, you made it. I'm here. Yeah, Eric, Sally, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Thanks, Peter. Good. I think we're almost. Uh, you know, we'll give another minute or two here, and then we'll have everybody in. Um, I said, I, Ann, Ann Jones has been, you know, we're so honored to have her with us. And so I, you know, I don't want to prolong this any further. Uh, uh, so I want, I want to start out with Ann. And, and, and Ann, traditionally what we do to start our meetings is um, we come up with some inspirational uh, statement or whatever, or song or, or whatever. Um, and so as an introduction to you, uh, and then and then we'll turn, turn the, uh, this, the whole scene over to you. Um, and by the way, Ann, and, 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 and jump in if I misrepresent this, but Ann wants to have a conversation with us, right? Uh, she doesn't necessarily want to lecture yeah. us. She wants to engage us in a conversation. So 
correct, Ian? That's yeah. correct. Okay. Uh, so let me, you know, as an introduction to Ian, let me just uh, very quickly read the, the last paragraphs of her book, They Were Soldiers, um, which is, which is, was my, I'd read some of Ann's stuff before, but this was my real introduction to, to her, her work. And I was, I was just absolutely stunned by this book um, because it tells a story, it tells a narrative that most people don't hear. So let, so let me, oh, let me introduce Ann by reading these, this, these two paragraphs, okay? At Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 2011, I met a woman from a small town <clears throat> from a small town in West Virginia, the mother of a 19 year old soldier whose legs and genitals were blasted to pulp in Afghanistan. She quit her job and moved to a motel near the hospital, then in Washington DC to care for him while her husband worked a second job at home to make up part of her lost wages. She had been at the hospital for six months. She hoped to bring her son home someday, perhaps in another year or so, and she expected to take care of him for the rest of his life or hers. She said, people expect me to be happy that he survived. And I believe I am, but I can't really remember what happy feels like. If her son had been killed, she would have been expected to feel proud, but that wasn't the word she used. She told me, my other son, his older brother was about to graduate from high school. He was going around looking for a job. One day he came home and said, I can't get a job in this town, so I joined the Navy. He was ashamed to come home and tell his dad and me that he couldn't find work. We're not a military family, but there wasn't anything we could do about it. He was 18 and he's made a good job of the Navy. He's still in. But then when our younger son was finishing high school, of course he had to outdo his big brother. So without telling us, he joined the Marines and bam. Overcome, she sat quietly for a few minutes, looking at her hands, collecting herself. Then she turned her eyes to me again and said, we don't know how any of this happened to our kids. Say the name of the book again, please, Doug. The name of the book is They Were Soldiers, How the Wounded Returned from America's Wars, The Untold Story. I could read a ton more from this book, but I'm going to shut up and turn it over to Anne. Anne, welcome, and uh, it's yours. Thank you very much, and um, I hope we can have a conversation about um, Afghanistan and other wars. Um, I had to read, um, for other reasons, I had to reread the book that Doug has just read from um, as I was, uh, after I had written a piece um, that's going up at uh, Tom Dispatch, um, which some of you may know a website that's affiliated with the nation. And that will be going up next Sunday. So I, my experience, um, let me see where to start with a group of people who have no idea who I am or why I'm here. Um, my experience was um, in Afghanistan, I went there because I was very much opposed to um, George Bush's war on uh, the people of Afghanistan, which of course was a war totally without basis. Um, and um, so I went, uh, as soon as the US finished bombing Afghanistan, I went to Kabul and uh, found a woman there who was um, running a small organization with Afghan women, an American woman who'd lived there most of her life. And um, I went to work with them, trying to pick up some of the, the pieces. There was very little left of the capital of Kabul when I went there. And so everybody um, needed help. And uh, so I got started on that and I did that um, every winter um, for until about 2012, so 10 years. And, um, and during that time, uh, 
well, after I'd been there for four years, I wrote a book called Kabul in Winter about what the experience was that far and what it had meant to Afghan women and girls to be able to get out from under the Taliban. And um, now recently, of course, um, well, I've been in touch with my friends in Afghanistan and been back for brief visits um, up until a couple of years ago. Well, up until the pandemic. And, um, and I'm in touch with my women friends still in Afghanistan and with others whom I worked with for years uh, who are now uh, confined at Fort McCoy in Wisconsin along with some 13,000 or more other Afghans. They've been there since August. Um, one, one of those friends is a, a woman named Mary Akrami, who was one of the founders of the, the wonderful umbrella organization for all the women's organizations, women's rights organizations in Afghanistan, the Afghan Women's Network. And that was thought by our State Department to be such a great achievement. And the State Department was so proud of how Afghan women had taken command in the, in the cities. Um, Mary Akrami and others were invited to come to the US and meet Hillary Clinton and the president and on and on. Uh, now she is in confinement at Fort McCoy. Um, the State Department got her out together with nine members of her family, including a, a brother and a sister who are both in wheelchairs, each with a different ailment that seems to have no English name. Uh, and so Mary is there looking, looking after all these members of her family. And um, the other of my best friends in that same facility is a woman named Homaira Rasuli. I met her when she was about 17. She came to work for an organization I was working with then called Medica Mundial, a German organization um, that works with women in, uh, in the aftermath of wars. They had started in Kosovo, Afghanistan was their second place. And um, she came to work there. She rose through the years, uh, became the leader, uh, the president of the organization, then she left, handed it off to a younger woman, went to law school, and now she defends women in the courts of Kabul. So she's, she's had this amazing career. And uh, now she's sitting in Fort McCoy. Um, so all this has been on my mind. And then my very best Afghan friend, uh, Mabuba Siraj, who um, some of you may have seen, she's interviewed a lot on uh, um, media and on um, line and so on. Although the Taliban has told her she's not allowed to do that, um, but she does. And she is also a founder of the Afghan Women's Network and she is there now running the, um, the women's shelter that the network uh, had established. There were about 90 women in it when the Taliban took over and uh, 50 of them made a run for it. And we don't know what's happened to them. Mabuba is taking care of 40 of them and getting a lot of assholes from, from the Taliban. So um, these things are very much on my mind. And part of the reason why I read, reread They Were Soldiers 
because towards the end of my work with women, I, I had developed quite a dislike for the American forces in Kabul. They behaved so much differently uh, from uh, all the other armies, the NATO forces, who, who uh, periodically early on had been in charge of, of Kabul or of, of the capital and of the country. And um, those guys were really nice guys uh, who would walk around town and give the kids rides in their Jeeps and stuff like that. Everyone liked them. Uh, the Americans came in uh, full force. You would have thought they were coming to, um, to attack the capital. And uh, they did not make a good impression and they, they haven't improved upon it at all. Um, in fact, they've, they've made it worse. So um, I, I uh, looked at this book, which is, I finished writing 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. They were soldiers. And um, I found that all the arguments, <laughs> all the problems today that people are discussing about uh, America's leaving Afghanistan, um, all the indicators of why we should leave and why this was an okay time to leave and all of that. It's all in my book that I wrote 13 years ago. Uh, so we've been wrong in Afghanistan for a long time. If we had stayed for um, the less than one year that it took to accomplish our original mission, um, it would be a very different world. Now, I can't say what it would be, but certainly America would be very different and Afghanistan as well. So that's a little bit about who I, what my experience has been there. Um, I will say that just before joining this crowd, I was um, listening, uh, watching a, a Zoom meeting that, um, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft um, recorded last week. I, I, I'm a, a non-resident fellow with the Institute, but I hadn't been able to see it. So they sent me the recording, which features um, Barney Rubin, uh, the, the great Afghan specialist, and um, many very highly informed uh, um, members of the Institute, all of whom have some, uh, a, a great deal of military and um, mm -hmm. political science experience. And um, I was very interested in the discussion because they all had to comment on um, how this removal from Afghanistan could have been done better, could have been accomplished better, and what their expectations had been for why it wouldn't possibly go this way. And <clears throat> all of them said that they never could have imagined that the, the um, American, that the American trained Afghan army would just collapse or that the government would run away. And um, so they were all taken by surprise. This is, these are, um, you know, a, a, a room full of some of the nation's best experts, <laughs> all of whom are um, pacifists at heart, but they, and they study their expertise about the military to prevent um, this kind of thing. And, Every one of them was wrong. They were absolutely wrong. 
uh, in the expectation they had had, even Barnett Rubin. And the reason they were wrong, I realized, was they study war, but they did not study Afghans. They seemed to know nothing about Afghan traditional behavior, ways of behaving and ways of getting along with, with each other, which made it perfectly possible for all the aid workers I knew and still am in touch with to predict almost exactly what happened and when it would happen. So with those comments, <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, ask you what you think about the, this withdrawal and, and perhaps deal with any questions you might have about it or anything else having to do with Afghanistan or your own experience with um, other wars which have ended badly. So, okay, uh, Dr. Jones, Anne. Um, uh, if, if, if you have a comment to make or a question for Anne, please unmute yourself and, and, and do so. Um, I'm gonna start off by two things. One, one are a couple of things I, I remember from your book. One was uh, when you embedded uh, with the United States Army, how you were, again, stunned, I think, by their lack of knowledge of Afghanistan. You had spent years in Afghanistan and embedded with these characters who thought that they knew what the country was like when they really did not. So this seems to be just like what, what happened to us in Vietnam. I didn't know anything about the Vietnamese culture at all, period. Um, and this looks like to be, it continues to happen, right? And I'd, I'd like to know, uh, you know, uh, from our, our Iraq war veteran guy, people, uh, you know, if they were in fact informed about what the Iraqi culture was like or anything like that, does that happen? And Anne, please expand on that if you wish. Well, uh, it's uh, the things that are most notable, I think, since enlisted people take their cue, I would imagine, I've never been in the military myself, but I would imagine that you take your cue from your officers. And if the officers don't know anything about basic etiquette in the country that you're trying to pacify, um, what do you do? <laughs> um, so things like when you go to the, to the countryside to talk to the people who you think you have just liberated and you walk in to the meeting of, of men, the village elders, all <laughs> gathered in a circle, seated on their very best carpet under their very best tent, for you and you walk in with your muddy boots and you stand on the carpet and lecture yep. them about the greatness of America and how grateful they should be and then walk out, you do not make a good impression. And in all those years, they'd been there, when I embedded with the soldiers, they'd been there for 11 or 12 years already and they still had not learned it. And when they got women soldiers, they put the women soldiers, American soldiers, they had them to make a good impression on the locals because they had decided the men weren't giving them any information. Maybe the women could get good information from the women. So they started women's groups that, of soldiers that would go and visit with women and they got them what they thought was a uh, hijab, such as Afghan women. Well, Afghan women don't really wear hijab, um, but they got them scarves that they thought were what the Afghan women would recognize as very proper Islamic wear and to put over their helmets. And, um, but they got them from Iraq. So they were completely the wrong thing and Afghans 
if any Afghans did know what they were, they would be scared to death of them. So it was that kind of thing. Laura, Laura you have a question for Anne? I see your hand up, yes. Yes, um, Anne, uh, I had a question about what would be the best way to support the Afghan Women's Network. I was Googling over here while you were talking and I, um, I don't know if I have the right website. So could you, uh, if you know the website, could you share it with us? And well, um, I also had um, a, a thought about, even though I'm an Iraq war veteran, um, talking about how much training you have before you go over in culture. And um, my first deployment was in 2006 and I was deploying um, outside the wire is this the term that we would use when you go off base and um, you know it in a in a way that you would expect that you would probably want to have an interpreter you'd probably want to you know have a really in-depth explanation of the culture and it, no joke what I got was a, a brochure uh, they gave Uncle Sam gave me a brochure about Iraq and it had like a very basic uh, little map on it it was um, it was laughable, uh, and it had some Arabic phrases that uh, had a, a sound out guide that I butchered completely. And um, I just spent my whole time over there, the first time just trying not to die. Uh, my, my second time over there, um, I had about a month's worth of cultural training, and I served as a um, an interrogations analyst for Camp Cropper, and we helped we were supposed to be helping shut down Camp Cropper in 2010, um, and it was a uh, it was a cluster. I think is the right right term for it. But um, I hope that gives you some idea. As it it really depended on what your mission was, what service you were with, and where you were going, as to what type of training you received, and the quality of that really depended on how well the units spoke global war on terror funding. So um, I'm really sorry. And did you feel that the training that you got was actually pertinent? Was it useful? Do you know how the people you were talking to received you? The, on the first deployment, um, I was really quite oblivious uh, because the only time I ever went out was when we were responding to something really horrible. So I didn't really have much time to think about culture. Uh, but the second deployment, I actually learned the most from our interpreters who were from places like Jordan. And um, my, my guy was from Jordan. He was, um, he provided a lot of, he was in his seventies and he smoked long stemmed cigarettes and he looked like something straight out of a noir film. He was wonderful. And he taught me so much about um, just customs and courtesies and you know the, the challenges of being a woman in a male dominated culture where you're trying to appear knowledgeable. Uh, there was a lot of, lot of interesting cultural exchanges going on there. And getting that cultural information, did that help you feel more, less nervous? Did it help you feel more like you knew what you were doing? That's a hard one to answer because um, I think I could have spent a hundred years there and never really understood because I'm, I'm a white woman from Texas and I have, I do not possess that ability to really fully appreciate that, especially, uh, you know, this was ages ago, this was in 2010. So I was, you know, in my twenties, um, the, I was lucky that I had my head on straight as much as I did back then. So um, I certainly wasn't prepared to be, uh, diplomatically representing anyone, much less um, dealing with people that weren't being given due process. And that was a hard one to realize. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm veteraning and so boxing at you. I apologize. No, you're not. No, no. 
I, I appreciate your I appreciate your comments and I understand that feeling and I don't mean to say that I became an expert at um, at Afghan manners, but uh, I do think that this very simple things that can help people from making a, a really bad first impression um, are things that are pretty easily taught and in all those years, as far as I could see, were never taught to our, our people in Afghanistan. And uh, mm. we paid a price for it, and the Afghans certainly did too. But Don Kimball has a question for you, Ann. Don? Yes. Hi. That was a really good give and take between you guys, and uh, that's what's so great about this chapter. And Doug, thank you for having Ann on. And uh, yeah, that was really, really interesting to hear from somebody who had uh, been there. Laura, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and I just have one quick question. Uh, your opinion about, uh, I, I'm not a real diplomat. I don't know if you, you sound like you, you've got a lot more experience with, than I do uh, with these type of things. And I had some figures here somewhere, and of course I can't find them right now, but what is the difference between, uh, right now uh, the Afghan government's uh, assets have been frozen and the number of Afghan people who are becoming food insecure has just gone up really, I, I, it's in the tens of millions. And of course, wintertime is coming on. What's the difference, Anne, between a fro free, freezing the assets of a country and sanctions? Because we all know sanctions hurt the little people. Uh, look at the sanctions in, in Iraq that were responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of, of children. Uh, what's the difference between freezing the assets and, and, and sanctions? Aren't they kind of both doing the same thing? They're just, they're going to they're starving people. Thank well, you. We're, we're, that's a great question, but we're not the government anymore. So we froze the assets that we had contributed to the government, which we installed and then which Mr. Trump completely disregarded and um, and then who understandably ran away. Um, so we can't, if we leave that money there, um, then the Taliban government could presumably use it. But there is no Taliban government. And this is another great misunderstanding of Afghan customs. The Taliban are, uh, are not a people who, uh, in fact, most Islamic people in Afghanistan do not make hierarchies. And we keep talking about the government and which, which mullah is number one and which is number two. And we had a great furor about the fact that when the leaders of of this new onslaught of the Taliban actually did meet in the palace and uh, because they had to present some sort of uh, list of their leaders to the public. Um, Mullah Bardar, who the US had been betting would be the um, number one, uh, was actually was number two. And number one came from the Haqqani network, which is backed by Pakistan and which is much more violent and weird. And um, you do not want to give them your money. Um, so these kinds of arguments are going on within our government and they're pointless because there is no government in existence and the Taliban are not making a government. That's not how they function. Um, they don't function very well. Uh, so we can't, we wouldn't sanction, we might want to sanction a Taliban government, but there isn't one. And um, 
we don't want to give them any money, so we have to um, freeze the money that was in the government. Now, about the fact that large numbers of Afghans will starve, that's another story. And um, the, um, the humanitarian organizations, the international organizations are trying to get on top of that and they need money. And so um, it's the, it's the um, international organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières and, and the others who will be trying to deal with that and trying to move in, they need money right away to move in supplies that they can store that can then be delivered in the winter. They have to make deposits all across the country because of the way the mountain passes work there. Um, they're often, it's often impossible to get from one side of the country to the other. So the, um, the humanitarian organizations are very strategic about where they place food aid and other humanitarian aid that they can fly into in the winter and deliver in one part of the country and then hit the other part of the country. That, they're trying to make that happen now. I don't know what kind of success they're having. So the, um, there was a question before about how to help Afghans. And I would think at this point, if you wanted to contribute to helping Afghans on the ground, the best thing would be to uh, make a contribution to one of those international uh, re very reliable humanitarian organizations that's working to meet that crisis. Yeah, you mentioned Doctors Without Borders, if my French is still good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doctors Without Borders, but there are others, there are several others, and I'm sure, um, I can't Google these things because I'm losing my eyesight, um, but I'm sure that you can um, go online and find out who is doing that work now. And you will certainly know the names of the, the um, ones that are most internationally active. Mm, hey, Garrett. Yeah, thank you, you Ann. Thanks, thanks. And Ann, Garrett, did you have a question? I, I think you had your, the hand up, yes? Yeah, just... Uh... It's it's interesting to me about the Quincy Institute and and uh, kind of the reaction you had to them and I think it I think it boils down to this problem that we have about I mean we have these contradictions about how and why we go to war and who it benefits and what our goals are as as an American people right and and the goal of of our communities and our neighbors um, are often different than that of our corporations and um, our military so. You know how how do we go and fight a, fight a, fight a war is different than how we go and win a war, and um, it's not surprising to me that all these people are stumbling over themselves, surprised about you know how and what happened in Afghanistan um, the way it did because you know even even on a soldier level you know we're we're taught to other people quite effectively to be able to kill them and to do our job and. Um, you know, the pressure is not just in the military and in the training and conditioning that we have, but it's in our society and it's in a, the, the American environment it comes down to the American exceptionalism that we have. And, uh, you know, the xenophobia, uh, the Islamophobia um, are all play huge factors in that. So it conditions us as uh, enlistees and, and even officers going into the military. We come from this environment then we get we get trained basically and conditioned further to other people and then we're, we're sent to those nations and is it surprising that we're not taking the time to understand them as a people um you know there's there's actually i think inhibitors in place to prevent us from understanding people so we can other them better and so we can kill them and uh you know the the booklet i said i want to you know just reinforce what laura said uh the uh the booklet I got was, was, uh, you know, it was a tiny booklet and it, it was uh, at the time I went into Iraq, I didn't serve in Afghanistan. 
I went to Iraq in 2004 in the OIF two. So right after the initial invasion, um, I went in, um, and, uh, it was, it was classified as stability and st support operations when I went in and the booklet was mostly tactical and strategic, um, and not, uh, there, there was, there was a very thin section on understanding, uh, language and culture or anything like that. Now to, to the point of where it really was like a paragraph, what is Sunni, a paragraph, what is Shia, um, the, the one page of common terms that are used. And uh, that, that's mostly it. So, you know, that's what I had to go on when I went to Iraq. And, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, you surround yourselves with, you know, 18 to 24 year old, mostly men who are scared to death and doesn't, doesn't understand the language, the culture, the customs of, of a people that you're sent to basically occupy. And what do you think the results are gonna be? It's, it's not good. Most of the people in my unit were so convinced that they didn't want to get captured by the enemy that they would do all sorts of things to themselves and you know risk risk their own lives and and kill themselves rather than being captured because the horror stories were so grim of you know just not understanding another human people um you know we would get in conflicts all the time because of just miscommunication and you know i remember one time we were trying to give uh uh this sheik and shake in one town um, uh, pamphlets that look like dollar bills. Um, and it was basically, it's, it said on them, if, if you have information about people planting improvised explosive devices, you turn them in and we'll give you real money. And they were just these ridiculously large dollar bills. And, uh, we, we brought them to this dude in a pallet and, and he thought it looked like we were paying him off. And here were American soldiers with a pallet of giant dollar bills. And he was embarrassed and scared because he thought the word would get around that he just got paid off as a collaborator. So the very next day when we're riding through town to see if there was any information given, we get attacked by him and his men, who was a, an ally to us like the day before, because he needed to, to save face and show all everybody else that he wasn't in collaboration with the U.S. forces. So now here we're in engagement, getting U.S. soldiers killed and his, his people killed over a miscommunication error. You know, we just, we just didn't understand tribalism. We didn't understand a way of life that wasn't based and rooted in capitalism. And we were conditioned to hate people and fear people because of othering. And this is the result. And it goes through our entire culture. Um, and the people sitting on those panels are also conditioned in the same way. So of course they, they didn't have a crystal ball and could see that because they didn't live with folks and understand them. So thank you, Anne, for like bringing this up. And it, it kind of does, I mean, it's almost, it, it is embarrassing to see people in some of the highest positions in the American government still just deceiving themselves on, <laughs> on what culture and connections we have with other people around the world. It's harsh, thank you. Yeah, thank so you I, yeah. for that I'm classic, sorry. that's a great story. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Peggy and Dunn and myself nodding our heads, Vietnam veterans going, yeah, it's exactly the same situation we are faced with. I, I, I want to take another tack, Anne, if I might. And, and I want to start by commenting on one of the things I was really struck by, your sense of what a really true investigative reporter does, right? And Anne's book is mostly about uh, coming back to the United States with severely wounded Afghan Amer uh, uh, veterans from the Afghan war uh, in, into their homes. And rather than depending upon national newspapers, what you did was you went to these towns, these little towns and these forts, and you, in, and you looked at the local papers and, stuff, and, and saw the, the accounts of murders, of suicides that were taking place and whatnot. And here's another, just another excerpt from her from Anne's book that I think really captures another side of war. She says, the wife of an active duty soldier often is a girl, barely out of her teens, who married not long before her shiny new husband in his oh so smart uniform deployed, and is now caring for her baby and her moody combat soldier just returned from war and seemingly not very well. He is sullen and silent. He isolates himself locks himself in the bedroom for hours on end or disappears in the car sometimes for days. He drinks too much, he drives too fast or too slow down the middle of the road, he explodes, he throws things, he punches holes in the walls, smashes dishes, 
shakes the children. I mean, that's an, yet another aspect of war that I think this culture is not very aware of, is the impact it has on the people who are at home, the loved ones, if you will. Um, so I don't know if you want to pursue that or anybody wants to jump in. Um, you probably know as much about those that subjects or that subject or more than I do, but I certainly witnessed it because I was also part of the feminist movement in this country, and I worked uh, a lot on. Well, one of my first books was called "Women Who Kill," and some of those women were driven to defend themselves in battles of what we call domestic violence. And some of them are for the reasons you suggest in reading that passage. Um, so yes, I think we're, anyone else want to comment on that topic? Okay. Uh, yes, I, I think that, um, sorry, my camera was off. I think um, most veterans can attest that uh, we've had multiple marriages, most of us. I've been married three times. Uh, the military is not good for any sort of intimate relationship or just any relationship of any kind, really. Um, I can't tell you the number of nights my mother has spent, uh, you know, terrified and praying and all that stuff that she, you know, told me about later. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's absolutely brutal on family life and uh, learning how to be a human being and fit in society when you get home is sometimes very entertaining. But I always say that um, combat veterans are like wounded animals. And that need to be rehabilitated and and some of us do better than others but um you know just be patient and uh and love that's about all you can do I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry and I'm to respond to that by saying um that's a familiar familiar story to me too because my own father fought in world war one where he came and came home with all sorts of medals and all the demons that come with that kind of conflict. So I grew up in a household under a father like that. So I can understand. And it's why I'm a single girl myself. <laughs> you know, my, my personal story is I was met by the woman to whom I've been married for the last 50 some odd years. Uh, she met me in San Francisco after I got back from Vietnam and we hitchhiked across the country. I realized what I did to my parents by doing that, by being on the road for three weeks. But uh, I really do think that, that that amazing experience was much better than coming home with a, you know, the sign saying, welcome home, Doug, and all this crap and stuff like that. We were on the road a lot and it, it helped a lot. Um, Garrett. Garrett. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Garrett, you got a question or a comment? Yeah, I just uh, I just found that book that I was talking about. Oh, First Infantry Division Soldier's Handbook to Iraq. Uh, so this is from uh, 2004. Um, the book has I don't know about 80 pages in it, and these eight pages here are the consists of what's called Arab Customs and Culture, Part Three. Um, so that's, this is what I got when we actually are able to meet in person one day um, and have a physical uh, chapter meeting again, I'll, I'll remember to bring this book and uh, pass it around. Folks can take a look at it. It's, it's kind of enlightening on, on how we were prepared uh, to go into rock. And um, as, as far as the, the question about relationships and um, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't very stable when I was in, I was constantly training and deploying as a combat arms, cavalry scout and, and then sniper. Um, so I didn't really have time to meet anybody or, or start a family. And then after I got home, it took me about seven years to really get my head screwed on straight enough to have a relationship, but I probably, because of my moral injury, um, I didn't, I, I was in a place where I didn't feel like I've, I deserved any sort of happiness. Um, 
so I pretty much sabotaged any good thing that I had um, for almost seven years, whether it was uh, family, friends, um, romantic relationships, jobs. Um, so it was, I was pretty much a mess. I, I never stuck a barrel in my mouth, but I put myself in a lot of high risk situations uh, where I, I'm surprised I'm not dead. And uh, I, I would never have, uh, ne- you know, I certainly wouldn't have prevented it <laughs> from happening. So um, yeah, that's that uh, passage kind of struck me. And certainly there are, uh, you know, the the military is a, a changed place, but some things never change as we know from our Vietnam era folks to to my generation of, of service members. Um, we're going in far too young and uh, coming out uh, far too damaged. So yeah, thanks, Ann. Can I raise another um, topic because, um, uh, and and thank you for that, those comments. It'd be interesting to find out if the, those Arab customs really apply to Iraq. There are Arabs in a lot of places <laughs> and they, you may have the wrong handbook. That would be, that would be worse. But um, I'm, I am particularly angry right now because um, if I if I could return to the fact that I wrote my this book um, more than a decade ago and that we still stayed and made that war, if we knew all these things or if it was possible to know all these things. Um, well, I think in the first year of the war, or certainly by the 10th year of the war, why did we stay? And of course, I'm sure you all know that the only answer is, is uh, all those people who made out like bandits, um, the, the millionaires and billionaires who have just fed off this war. And I, to me, that also helps to explain the terrible way in which we exited from the war and the ridiculous, just ridiculous so-called negotiations that have been going on, started by the Trump folks with the Taliban, whom whom they expected to tell the truth. Um, All of, uh, it's all been done for the rich. It's all been done to make money for the corporations. Um, Everything, all the things that I hear or read in the papers now about our reasons for leaving Afghanistan, we knew um, 20 years ago. We knew after being there for a year or if the slow learners certainly knew it a few years later. And uh, so what has really come home to me um, that I've, I've learned from, um, I've learned a lot of this from you, Doug, and from my experiences with um, Veterans for Peace is, um, that the military not only seems to have no, the the military brass seems to have no respect for the indigenous people as we've been talking about, but they don't have any respect for their own soldiers either, as far as I can see. Yeah, I always took exception to being referred to as an asset which was, you know, yeah. <laughs> I have friends who are officers now, but I, I did not get along in any officers when I was in the service, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, they talk about how many assets can you afford to lose to take this hill, right? Wait a minute, you're talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> Holy crow. Well, yeah. just, just like the Pentagon papers revealed about Vietnam, yes. the Afghanistan paper two years ago revealed that for years the military knew we were going to lose in that at war, and yet we still hung in and killed, I don't know how many people. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but now I I get concerned about 
how um, there's no draft anymore. And so they've, they've built up all these, um, what do you call those educational programs in the high schools? Oh, uh, our, the Junior ROTC program. Junior ROTC, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I did have, I did for another project I, I was working on, I did go into some of the schools, particularly the black <laughs> schools in Boston um, and sat in on Junior ROTC courses and uh, got to know the kids and talked to, talked with them quite a bit. And, you know, some of them were 15 years old and they were already signing up to go into the military. And many of them were from homes where there wasn't any dad. And, uh, you know, their mother was just barely able to keep a roof over their heads. And uh, so they thought that this was going to be a chance for them, the one chance they'd have to really help out their family and to get ahead themselves. And guess who the teachers were in all these classes? Mm -hmm. They're all retired military colonels and yeah. on up. Yeah. 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 I, I actually, had a, on a few occasions, would go into a recruiter's office with a young person and just sit there and take notes, you know, which changed the whole tenor of the conversation, you know. Uh, and I, you know, it's, you know, so you're, oh, you're promising this guy he's going to be this, this, and this, right? You know, and uh, it's, they still do that stuff. We've been, as Veterans for Peace, we've gone into many high school settings. Um, in fact, we're named after, our chapter's named after Tom Sturdivant, who was a, an amazing member of our chapter who did a lot of that. He was a high school teacher himself and he got us involved in going into schools and counter recruiting, if you will. Uh, but as Garrett pointed out in his, in his, in his chat uh, note there, that's called the economic draft. What, what we're witnessing right now, right? I mean, it's not, yeah. they're not big for it, but they're, they're looking around and going, and I live in a rural town and it happens here all the time. They look around and say, I can't get out of here. The only way I can get out of here is join the military. Yeah. Um, so truth in recruiting. Yeah, and it, it will become more and more like that, the more oh, yeah. lopsided this economy becomes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Lots to work on. What are, what are you folks working on as an organization most now? Do you have a particular focus? Well, I, I, Gary can re probably respond to that on, on a national level. But, you know, I mean, we're, we're plodding along doing the same thing we're here. Like we're, we're preparing for, uh, uh, to be in, in Portland uh, on so-called Veterans Day, we call it Armistice Day, uh, to uh, inform people about, they should be referring to it as Armistice Day and not, and not uh, Veterans Day and stuff like that. Um, uh, we we work with Moms Demand uh, Action, who are trying to get guns uh, out of our culture. And and one of the arguments that they used that didn't fly very well is what they call the red flag bill, uh, which we testified at, at the state house saying, you know, guns are killing veterans, right? Uh, and so it, couldn't we at least have some kind of bill in place that you know the loved one of a veteran could call and get the guns confiscated and stuff like that? Heaven forbid! Oh my gosh, can't do that kind of stuff. Um, so, Garrett, you want to respond to what we're doing on the, on the national level? And can I put you on the spot for that uh, <laughs> to answer Ian's question? Uh, there really is too much. Um, I mean, we're, we're a grassroots uh, democratic organization. So, you know, most of everything that we do is just membership driven and it becomes it becomes a thing because of grassroots organizing efforts on, on usually a local level and sometimes just based around issues. Um, yeah. Probably one of the one of the biggest things going right now is Gamers for Peace. It's an initiative um, that comes out of our Truth and Recruitment Counter Recruitment Program, uh, but it's a way to combat uh, predatorial recruitment online. Um, almost um, since COVID hit, really all the recruitment has gone digital. Um, so they actually have military mm -hmm. occupational specialties MOSs of recruiters that play video games online, and. Wow. Uh, they don't have to identify themselves as recruiters, um, but they're playing the games with with our young, young, young adults and kids. Um, and basically, if if your kid's playing a video game in their living room or in their bedroom, 
Um, they could have 10 recruiters talking to them on this video game uh, and you wouldn't know it, um, trying to recruit them and, and force them to join, uh, get them in private conversations before they even reveal that they're a recruiter and that um, you know they have an opportunity for you. Um, so we're doing what we can in Gamers for Peace. We do live streams. We're doing about 20 hours of content a week on Twitch and uh, we have a mentorship program, mentoring uh, young adults, recruitable age. We're going to have two scholarships called Alternatives to Military Recruitment Scholarships next year, um, where military family members uh, who are going to college can apply for that. And it's an alternative to, to join. So which means their parents are veterans, which means they could be potential Veterans for Peace members. Um, so it's a way to in increase recruiting on college campuses where younger veterans are. And also there are younger veterans uh, and active duty playing video games that uh, we can recruit as well. So um, gamers for peace we've got a strong discord channel um, there's a kind of a community of solidarity there that people are going to and recruitable adults are going uh, recruitable kids are going to um, to have conversations with our veterans and um, there's a lot of organizing around that um, our climate and militarism project is pretty big right now um, it's basically trying to expose the fact that the u.s military was one of the largest polluters uh, on the planet and uh, that they not only not only is their carbon uh, footprint really large in their energy use, but they also um, are the chief protectors of exploitative uh, and extractive colonialism around the planet and uh, train and actually uh, intervene on uh, any sort of popular resistance against uh, resource extraction. Um, we're seeing that in our own country, obviously, with like line three and uh, the military uh participating and trying to crack down in uh, Standing Rock. So we see it here and we see it uh, obviously in, in more disgusting ways overseas uh, and protecting the transportation of fossil fuel all around the, all around the planet. Um, without the US military, a lot of those pathways would be shut down. So we're doing that. Save Our VA is, uh, is a big program, um, trying to stop the privatization of uh, the VA. Uh, our deported veterans project is, is really large, uh, trying to bring our deported veterans home. It also highlights the entire problem with immigration and ICE uh, and, and the border issues that we have. Um, so we're doing a lot of partnering with the uh, School of America Watch through, uh, through that. And we're putting up murals in, in American cities. I think we were at 32 um, after this weekend of, of murals that are being put up in cities. Uh, called the uh, uh, leave no one behind murals so there, i mean there's just there's just so much people are working on um there's that, a preach air force base and the drone uh, drone stuff yeah been involved in, you know, too, yeah right? i just got back from being out at, uh, at creech air force base the home of the hunters in the middle of the nevada desert uh don is a, a regular participant of of that but uh, we just got back of doing seven days of protests shutting down the base i think we shut down the gates uh, three times while we were out there, uh, did I think seven demonstrations total. Um, one of them in the middle of uh, Vegas in the in, on Fremont Street. We did a an art action, um, and uh, we actually uh, we created these QR codes. I don't know if you all know what a QR code is, but if you scan this with your phone, uh, it takes you to a website called AskVets.org. That's a direct letter to drone operators. And uh, we were handing out donuts with these napkins, uh, free donuts to uh, service members on Creech, telling them they could go to that website and get information about how to resist and how to blow the whistle on drone operations, just like our hero, uh, Daniel Hale. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're always busy doing something, um, whether yeah. it's local on the ground, you know, with, with Maine uh, doing so much at the, uh, at the ironworks and, and, uh, trying to clog up the military industrial complex or whether we're doing national calls to action, uh, joining people, people over Pentagon to uh, oppose the military budget or uh, push back against the AUMF. Um, we're always, we're always doing things. Great. It's That's great having you here. Thank you so much, Jared. That was wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. And this, um, I don't know how to do the raise your hand. So I'm just going to talk. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much and to Laura and Garrett for sharing, you know, such hard stuff. Um, I just wanted to respond to Garrett about the gamers. We just lost one of our 
not lost, they didn't die, but one of our homeless teens just, that's how I asked him how the recruiter was getting hold of him. It was through exactly that, you know, through the gaming. And now he's in the military. He's at basic training now. It's like, you know, it just breaks my heart, you know? And, um, And then when you were talking about, Anne, about the indigenous, you know, I remember, you know, like in Vietnam, we learn nothing about the Vietnamese people, and even the even the soldiers that were fighting with the Americans were they when they were wounded they they didn't use their names. They called them Mickey Mouse One, Mickey Mouse Two, you know, Goofy One, Goofy Two. They had they didn't even respect them as people, and they were the soldiers that were fighting with the American soldiers. It was and it was just it was just really horrible. And then Doug, when you were saying about the um that, you know, about Veterans Day, you know, we wrote that letter to the entire city council in Portland and um, not one single response, not one. And that was two weeks ago about inviting, you know, if we could be part of the parade and part of the speaking, nothing. I mean, that's the whole city of Portland, Maine city council didn't even respond to you and me who signed it. I, you know, so that's where, you know, that was pretty painful and Anyway, but thank you so want, much. Want to march in the parade? Go walk, march behind the parade with a big sign saying, we were not invited. But we <laughs> Maybe we should well, do that this year. <laughs> trust me, we've been in that parade. We don't march, by the way. We you know, we dutifully walk. Walk, <laughs> we're purposely okay. Walk. We, we, okay. Get, we ain't marching anymore. <laughs> but well, we've been kicked out of that parade a couple of times. Uh, one story I love to tell is uh, they one time the, the council said, the American Legion runs this damn thing, right? And they asked for, uh, they, they set up uh, signs along the main avenue in Portland with the, and they wanted to, you know, placards of names of, of people who were uh, killed in the Iraq war. Um, obviously thinking of soldiers. We said, that's a great idea. And we, we submitted, and they cost a hundred bucks, but we submitted the name of a six month old Iraqi child and they went ballistic when they saw that. They went nuts uh, and they kicked us out, all right, mm-hmm. which gave us a perfect chance to, you know, write letters to the editor and say, how can you kick veterans out of a Veterans Day parade, blah, blah, blah. We won it. Uh, and they had previously, we were the last, we were at the end of this parade for countless years, right? Um, the street sweepers were <laughs> with us. But after that, we said, we want to be up front. And we got up front. Um, and we were in that parade for a couple of years until we strung out a huge banner across the Congress Avenue that said, get out of Afghanistan now. Uh, and they went ballistic on that. <laughs> and so, But now what we do, what we're going to be doing this Armistice Day is we stand in, in Monument Square, which is where the parade goes by, with a big banner saying Armistice Day. And, we, and we're passing out stuff. And we're passing out Laura Morris's, hello, Laura, amazing cartoons that she's made about the F-15 um, and the cost of that and what an, an impact on our culture. So we're, we're kind of doing that kind of stuff. That's great. I'm glad you're all out there on the case. Don, did you, oh, Don, did you have something? I think you had a hand up a while back, no? Yeah, well, you know, Garrett did such a great job. I just wanted to mention there's also, Veterans for Peace has a military trauma working group and the Brown, led by Brown University, the Cost of War Project has mm-hmm. found that 30,000 Veterans and military people have chosen death by suicide. It's just hard to say. It's hard to say the words. 30,000 over the past 20 years have chosen death by suicide. And this is definitely on Veterans for Peace radar, the the military sexual trauma, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the moral injury, the traumatic brain injuries, uh, and not to even mention you know, the physical injuries too that all contribute to this. It, it's an epidemic. Uh, the average is between 17 and 22 a day, veterans a day uh, choose death by suicide. And I'm, I've been reading that more are choosing that way because there's been um, so much attention paid now or more attention is being paid now to how much this is a war that enriches the people at the top and uh, and doesn't really care about the fate of the enlisted people. Yeah, so, that's at the heart of the definition of moral injury, right? It's betrayal. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a, a real betrayal. Yeah, uh, and, absolutely. Yeah, many of us feel that way about it. 
Uh, I'm volunteering at this place, Travis Mills Foundation, where they work with uh, veterans who have been severely wounded. And I was there making lunch and handing out lunch the other day, and there were eight. Uh, they bring them from all over the country, and eight, eight Afghan veterans were there. And, and the average age is 35. Um, and th these these poor guys, I mean, they just they they look like deer in, in headlights. They were just so so strung out. It's it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, yeah. And you know, just to return for for a minute be, be, uh, to the topic we were talking about before of the the fact that you don't know anything about the country that you're in. Um, one the reason that the exit from Afghanistan was as terrible as it was um, is that. They, you know, all the predictions, and this goes back to all these experts that we've been hearing from, um, predicting that the Taliban might get to Kabul in three years, or it might be able to take Kabul in even two years, or the last one I heard was maybe even in less than a year. But um, Afghans, when they're fighting, all Afghans, when they're fighting, if they know they're, they're going to get into a bad fight and probably aren't going to get much out of it, they meet and talk to each other and work something out. And one side gives up and the other side says, okay, bye. And that is exactly what the Taliban did as they encircled the country this time, they, you know, President Biden saying, if these people are not going to fight for their own country, we're not going to fight for it. They wouldn't fight for the, they wouldn't fight against the Taliban because the Taliban were stronger. So they meet with them, they talk to them, they surrender. The Taliban goes on to the next city and does the same thing. And so those of us who know Afghan culture were just had a finger right on the day the Taliban was going to arrive in Kabul. And we were right, I'm sorry to say. Um, so uh, I, I, um, I know you want to get on with your meeting. I hate to end on that sad no. note after all the all the good things you were talking about that you're accomplishing and you know raising a little hell. Um, I'm I'm so glad to. I'm supposed to be on the board of this organization, but they never send me any information. Oh, um, so yeah. I I'm glad that you're bringing me up to speed here a little bit, and. Um, uh, I'm so proud of all of you and what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Yeah, Anne, we're just so honored to have you have you with us. It's uh, it's been exceptional.